and we've had a spectacular lineup. Looking forward to what we're setting up here next week or two. Uh, Dennis, you want to let us know what's what's on the horizon, please? So next week on Tuesday is uh, David Bersenio, the Southwest Regional Signer. He'll talk about roughing the passer. And Thursday is Mike, Mike Burton, the Division II Director of Football Officials. Uh, on Friday, next Friday, May 1st, is Tim Schroeder, Pac-12 umpire, and he'll give a presentation on holding. And we have a couple other people that are, are pending confirmation that will give presentations and those will come. But I think Dana sent out an email to the um, NMOA football officials outlining everything. And again, we really appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, Dana, uh, let's let's give it to Dana, Ms. Dana Pappas. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us again on a Saturday morning. Um, you know, it's good to have Saturday morning football in any way, shape, or form, just like it is having uh, Sunday football in any way, shape, or form. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us this morning and uh, continuing to work on your craft, even in these unconventional and changing times. I would especially like to thank Brad Rogers for joining us this morning as an NFL referee. We're always excited to have the individuals who are working at that level speak to us at the high school level and appreciate your your time, Brad. Uh, you are one of the officials in the, or referees in the NFL I have yet to meet, so hopefully down the road we'll be able to meet one another. But thank you so much for talking to officials here in the state of New Mexico and helping them to improve and get better as we hope for a high school season uh, this fall. So I will turn it over to Todd, I believe, who will formally introduce you, but thank you so much from the entire NMOA. Hey, morning guys. Um, it's a great Saturday morning and I'm gonna tell you, Brad's not gonna let you down. And I'm, I, and I'm not, and this isn't a hype game. This guy is, he's a legit guy that I happened to run into doing an Eastern New Mexico scrimmage in Clovis, New Mexico one night, just la a year ago and uh has been a great mentor and a friend to me but uh he's a great guy he's from lubbock texas he has two great daughters um outside of football he teaches uh business management at, at lubbock christian and texas tech and he's also the assistant uh, girls basketball coach at lubbock christian high school um he's been officiating football in texas and arizona since 91. um from 2001 2016 he officiated in the western states football league American Southwest, Lone Star, SWAC, um, Conference USA, and the SEC. Um, he's also officiated in Arena 2 uh, League uh, from 2007-2009 and the Arena League from 210 to 214. Uh, in 15, he became he joined the NFL Developmental Program and uh, was offered a field judge position in 17. He uh, worked a divisional playoff game in 18 uh, between the Chargers and Patriots. So if any of y'all fans of those games that he was there. Um, also, he is in his fourth overall season in the NFL and his second as referee. And that picture right there is his very first coin flip that you're seeing right there on the screen today. And that's a that's a pretty neat deal, folks. Not very many people can do it. And like we talked about the other day, there's only 17 guys in the country that do this. So let's listen up and learn a little bit from Brad. All right, brother. Well, thanks, Todd. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, good deal. Well, um, it, it's great to be with you guys I, and, and ladies. Um, I'm not sure how many ladies are on, so I wanna make sure I'm I'm uh, clear in that. But it's it's good to see where people are spending time trying to get ready for football. And I think oftentimes where we make the mistakes is, is that we move out of football season, we get into the, that, that dead time. And it really, what, what has happened with sports, especially for sports officials and players and coaches is there's no such thing as an off season. It's really a preseason. And our preseasons are extended. They're a little longer now than what maybe they were when we first got into this. But for those that really want to try to to do the job, right. And, uh, and be the best they can be. It's sessions like these, I believe, that that really 
uh, give you the opportunity to become better. And so I put some things together. I hope that it works. Um, this is really the pilot to it. So um, we'll, we'll make sure that we try to get you some information today uh, to help you. Um, Todd's been a, a fantastic friend. I've been excited to get to know him. Uh, we have a mutual friend, a guy that I went to high school with that he's friends with in Clovis. So, you know, there's there's uh, neat connections of how football uh, and and other friends brought us together. So um, I'm excited to hopefully get to meet more of you uh, down the road. Um, you know, we're just one state away from each other. So or, or one border away from each other and football is football. So I'm excited to get to learn with you and and hopefully we can share some good conversations. Um, I'm not able to move the screen. Is it something I need to do where I say share it or is there, let me see if I got this set up right. I think I got it now. Okay. Um, now I just minimized my entire screen. Your screen already, uh, Brad, I could, we could see you. I'm sharing your screen. Okay. For whatever reason, I clicked a button and now all of a sudden my screen is a little bitty. Um, trying to figure out how to make it get back to where I can see what I'm doing. It's it's the entire group of people is all I see. Um, good grief, let's see here. Now I see the logo. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what's happened here. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Brad. Yeah, we have audio for sure. Yeah, I, I, I can't even see my, I can't see my screen. Uh, it says I'm sharing the screen, but it doesn't show anything that I'm trying to share. Let's see here. Is your PowerPoint at the bottom of your? Screen no, I'm, I mean, the entire thing is gone. I'm, I'm like clicking around trying to find even where all of this, all I see is everybody's names. Gotcha. There it is. There we go. All right. So um, I want to share with you a book that, that um, I came across about a year ago. A friend of mine shared it with me. And uh, are you guys able to see that first cover? Yes, sir. Okay. The, uh, the pep talk is a really good book, and, and, uh, and I'm just going to share some things from it uh, with you, uh, and hopefully this carries over to the football field for you as you start doing your preparation. But the first uh, point that they share in the book is it says this, don't defeat yourself before you get started by allowing negative thoughts about past events burden you with limitations. Carl Sandburg wrote this, the past is a bucket of ashes. Rid yourself of self-doubt. Don't allow yourself to be defeated by preconceptions. And, you know, as we move into the football season, we've all made mistakes. We've all done things that, that we wish that we had done a little different. We may have had a call that we wish we could get back. And um, the, the only call that matters at this point is the ones that, that you're going to make. And, um, and, and that's the first talking point here. Number two, uh, seize the moment. In a pivotal moment, you can choose to say, this is my day and I will make the most of it. You know, it, it's so interesting to see with officials um, the, the ones that, that I've been around, I've been fortunate to be around a lot of people that desire to be as, as good as they can be. And, and it's those that seize the moment. They're the ones that, that want to have that pivotal play come their direction. Um, and, and being prepared to work on a Friday or Saturday or Tuesday, um, the preparation is what you're doing now. And don't lose that momentum. Seize the moments. Number three, nobody succeeds without the help of others. It takes a team effort. Trust others to do their jobs. The combined effort of everyone executing his or her job produces superior results. And, and I see this one talking to me in terms of what I need uh, as, a, as a crew mate. Um, we're never successful on our own. Uh, we, we have to stand alone and make calls at times. But from the standpoint of working together as a crew, if, if you have a crew mate or crewmates that are successful in getting playoff games, or getting the big game. You're a part of that. Um, it, one of the greatest honors this year for our crew was that um, everyone on our crew worked a playoff game. 
Um, I wasn't eligible because I'd moved a referee this year. So I wasn't an eligible official to work playoffs, but everybody else got one. And two of my crewmates were in the Super Bowl. And, you know, it was fantastic to, to see friends succeed. And you feel like you're a small part of that. And always remember that uh, your successes are built upon what other people have helped you be able to do. Number four, stay focused. Don't focus on the scoreboard. The final score will take care of itself. In business, in life, in football, whatever it might be, don't be preoccupied with how much money that you make. Um, don't be preoccupied with all the great calls that you've made. Concentrate on your task at hand. Uh, the, the money will come. And the money by that, by what they mean in the book is, is that the rewards will come uh, by, by staying focused, not focusing on what was done in the past. Number five, visualize your success. This will give you a goal that you will eventually attain. Um, maybe when you played sports or, or you're thinking about the game that's coming up, you visualize different plays. You think about different scenarios. You put yourself at the goal line and you see the ball coming in as a double action. Um, does the player's knee hit the ground and then he reaches across? Um, visualize those types of things. Visualize the successes uh, that you're looking for, um, goals uh, that you have. Um, those are things that will help you be successful. Number six, adversity is part of life. We hear adversity all the time, and sometimes I think it's overused, but, but it is part of our life. Don't let setbacks defeat you. Adversity makes you stronger. Um, you know, there's been, there's been moments where we wish that we had a way to be able to uh, reel in a flag that maybe we threw, wish we had a string on it and pull it back into our pocket. Um, maybe there's times where we could have sworn that we saw exactly how it happened and you see it on film. Be honest with yourself and say, you know what, I wish I'd have tucked that away. Uh, we've all been there, but don't be so prideful that you believe that uh, what you think you saw is the reality. Uh, allow yourself to to be coached and, and, and to get better. Number seven, be persistent. Never, never give in. Um, number eight, expect the competition to be strong. Don't, under, don't underestimate an opponent. Um, it's not that officials are opponents, but, you know, with us, we have 17 crews, and there's only one spot when it comes to a playoff game or a Super Bowl. And guys will push each other. It's amazing to see the, the guys that are really, really good friends that all work side judge. And they all know that only one of them is going to get to work the Super Bowl. And they push each other. They're constantly trying to make each other better. Um, and there's competition for that spot. But it's good competition. It's, it's competition that drives you to be better. Number nine, believe in others and others will believe in you. Uh, number 10, be a team player. That's probably one of the most important things we could ever share with each other. We all heard it growing up as, as kids. Number 11, believe and trust the process. Rid yourself of self-doubts. Um, and the last one here, number 12, believe you will succeed. Have faith in your future. Uh, the unseen, uh, when we walk onto the field, we don't have a script to know how the game is going to go. But what we do need to do is believe in our success, believe in our preparation. We're never going to be perfect. Um, we'll never have the perfect game. I remember one time, I was working a game at Eastern Arizona College, and it was Dixie State out of Utah. And, a, and the coach for Dixie State, I was on his sideline. They were the defending junior college national champions. I'd never had them before. And this coach um, was extremely upset. I was working line judge. He was extremely upset with my side judge. Well, if you've ever worked seven-man mechanics, you know that the line judge and side judge will never, ever have anything that they're going to have flags down on, for the most part, uh, on regular scrimmage plays, just like a headlinesman. Um, and a field judge. There's just not going to be a lot of interaction between the uh, those two positions. And in this play that happened, I don't even know what, what went on over there in front of the side judge, but this coach was extremely upset about a non-call. And as we were talking through, and I listened to him, and, and he was really, really upset, we had that, it was right before the half, we're walking off the field, and, and we had about a 300-yard walk to the field house, one of those where you walk to it and you get there for five minutes, you turn around and come back. And so as we're walking, he wants to get a piece of my side judge. And I said, Coach, leave it alone. I will take care of it. I will answer, or I'll ask the questions, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get an answer for you. Let me take care of that, and you not get into an, a discussion with him. Well, he was willing to, to back down on that. And I asked him, I said, can I ask you a couple of questions? And he said, sure. And uh, I said, Coach, I said, um, you know, you, you've, you would, you, you're up 14 to nothing. You, you've, uh, you've, you've probably played about 50 plays. Would you say that's, that's fair? 
And he said, yeah, we've probably had about 50 offensive plays, and now we're up 14 and nothing. I said, now, now with that, that one play, that's, that's really what you're upset about. Everything else you're okay with. And he went, yeah, yeah, I think you guys are doing a great job. And I said, okay. I said, uh, let's say that we have a second half. And let's say that um, you have 50 more plays and you score two more touchdowns and you win 28 to zero. So you've had 100 total offensive plays in this game. And there's only one play per half that you're a little bit upset at with us. I said, uh, coach, my coach always told me that every play in our playbook was designed to score. Is that true with your playbook? And he looked at me and he said, well, yes. And and he kind of looked at me puzzled putting the math together. And I said, well, coach, I said, uh, what you're telling me is, is that you're about 4% effective with your offense and we're about 98% uh, correct in doing our jobs, according to what you're telling me. And he laughed. He patted me on the back and said, you know what? Don't even worry about talking to the side judge. I said, no. I said, we're going to uh, work to have success. We want to be perfect. We want to do the job right. And, uh, and, and from that point forward, every time I had that, that individual coach, he was always super positive, and he always patted our officials on the back saying, hey, I know you don't always get it right, but, man, we sure do appreciate you. Um, I kind of went out on a limb trying to talk to him about that, and, uh, and, I, and I hoped that, that it would work out, and it, and it did. So choose your words correctly when you talk to a coach, especially if you're going to go in that direction. Um, let me share with you a couple of things here that – um, I go over with my crews. Um, it, it, it's, it's something I've used in high school. It's something I've used in college, and I use it in the NFL. Um, typically, each week, uh, I throw up one or two of these, and, uh, and we talk through them. These are all common sense things, but um, these are areas that um, someone identified at a meeting that I went to at one point or another, uh, plays that cause crew problems. And um, as you kind of look through these, these are going to be things you're like, yeah, we talk about this all the time. But these are super important that we remind ourselves of. Um, not seeing the entire play, being too quick. Um, oftentimes when you watch film, you see where uh, individuals will throw a flag and it's so quick that they miss the rest of the play. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that here in just a moment, um, how we can still have a flag down. The beautiful thing about football um, is we don't have to throw our flags the instant something happens. We can, we can be slow because we still have to officiate an action in basketball you blow your whistle, everything just stops. And and with football, we blow our whistle, things things slowly stop, but we don't want to just blow things dead. We've got to be able to work to officiate um, our plays. Um, it's super important that we uh, are slow uh, in what we do. Um, as you go through the list, uh, changes of possessions, uh, missing blocks below the waist, of course, that's something in, in the high school rules that um, hopefully people are not violating. Um, in, in most cases on the field. Uh, pick plays near the goal line. Uh, you know, you may have some sort of signal that you give to each other um, whenever you get close to the goal line. Uh, pick plays are big. When you get inside that 20-yard that line area, especially even inside the 10, you start to see a lot of pick plays happen. Uh, so when you're working deep or working on the sideline in a five-man crew or working down deep on the sideline in a seven-man crew, um, be prepared for those doubles and trips and quads to have some sort of pick action uh, going on to get people open. Um, late hits out of bounds. These are things that we've got to really do a good job with. Um, that's the last thing we want to miss is, is those kind of things. And, you know, we've had, we've had plays where when you're working as a referee and you have a quarterback running and uh, he's near the sideline and he just gets demolished, nobody wants their quarterback to be hit. They're, the, they're one of the most important players on the field. Um, I would encourage referees be very, very careful in throwing flags on late hits on quarterbacks. Of what you think might be a late hit, that player may still be in bounds. Let them be clearly in the bench area before you start getting involved. That's why you have a sideline official. Those officials are there to be able to determine if they're out of bounds, in bounds, it's a legal hit, it was just a good legal hard hit. Uh, be very careful um, when it comes to making calls from the middle of the field in regard to hits uh, that are near the boundary line. Um, missing point of attack fouls. I've got a play I want to show here in a moment um, that, that uh, we have a flag down, but it's the importance of getting the spot on, on kick returns. And then incorrectly enforcing a penalty. Uh, we, we, we never want to have uh, a situation with that. Um, more plays here uh, that, that you can run through. And, and Todd and, and, and the group, what I'm going to do is I have all of this downloaded into one continuous video. I'm going to send all of this, every bit of this. It's a link in a Google Drive. And you can have it to download and uh, use it if you if you wish.
fish. Uh, but it has all of these lists of things uh, through here that we want to be careful with. Uh, here's the next uh, set of lists, uh, getting beat to the goal line. None of us want that. But, you know, I'll tell you this. Oftentimes we get caught up and I don't want to be beat to the goal line and we miss fouls on the field. Uh, we want to make sure we get those things right because no coach is ever going to say, hey, um, you missed a foul, but good job getting to the goal line. Uh, they're not going to be uh, carrying on in that way. Uh, missing 12 on the field on either side. Uh, we want to we want to make sure that we we get all over that um, clock problems. That's everybody. Don't just be the uh, guy saying, well, that's my designated official over there that missed the clock. So too bad. Uh, this is something we want to do where we're all on that. And here's the remaining part of the list. Um, probably number 18 is one of those that I would say is as important as ever telling coaches. It wasn't my call. Um, I think we've probably all been there and been guilty of that. Well, coach, that wasn't mine to call. But we can be diplomatic in how we communicate with coaches in, in asking questions. Instead of making statements like it wasn't my call, coach, can you talk to me a little bit about what happened? Let me see if I can get an answer for you. Those are common sense things. And probably all of you, if you're on this call, you, you take this super seriously. And, and, and you understand the importance of communication and language that you use with coaches. I ask a lot of questions. When a coach is screaming and hollering um, and they're carrying on about something, I'll go over and I'll let them spew that out for a moment. And then I'll ask, coach, what is your question for me so that we can get this worked out and try to understand better um, what we may have missed? Um, I don't necessarily get into the conversation of, yep, you're right, we completely missed it, and that's that's all our bad. Um, but but we want to talk about how we can mitigate the problem. Um, sideline decorum, I know that's a big deal. And whenever you get into uh, stadiums that are a little bit smaller and you don't have as much sideline space, Sometimes you have to give a little leeway. We have some small high school stadiums over here uh, in these small towns, and the fence and the stands are about six yards behind the boundary line. Well, there's not a lot of room for coaches to work and players to work. And when I go to the sideline, when I've worked the sideline, um, I would go up and I'd ask questions, you know, especially when I had a nice marked up sideline. Um, I'd go up and I'd ask players that I would identify as not being ones that would get on the field. And I'd go up to them and say, hey, are you guys going to be on the field much tonight? You know, and no, we're not. Hey, can you help me out by keeping players back behind this line? Because I want your coaches to have plenty of room to work in this box right here. This is their, this is their area to coach. And I would identify the coach's box. And I'd do it in a way that um, it was all about giving them space to work. And, and then I'd talk about, you know, I need to be able to see plays up here. So I need to have room to work in my two-yard belt. So please help me with this. And I, I really, I, I found that I just had very little problems with the sideline um, by, by going up and just getting people to be involved and help uh, clean that up. So, you know, it's, it's good to have good sideline decorum. It's good to have communication. I would encourage you to go up and meet every coach. If they look like a coach, they're dressed like a coach, go up and meet them before the game. The worst thing in the world we can do as officials is the first conversation we have a co with a coach is bad news. Coach, here's the foul and here's why. Make sure you go up and introduce yourself and, and communicate with all of them. Um, this next segment here, and I know you've talked a little bit about this um, within other calls that you've had, but um, there may be different variations. There may be different language that we use, but game management is an area that um, I'm so fortunate that I got to work under Gerald Austin. Um, he, he had a, a fantastic NFL career. And the thing that he talked about the most was game management. He understood we were going to miss calls. He understood that we were going to have bad calls. Um, but game management was the area that he pushed so hard, and I appreciate his leadership in that. Some of the things that he's taught and, and talked about um, in clubs that you may have attended um, is things like this, field presence, fitness and appearance, rules and mechanics knowledge, personal qualities, accuracy and consistency. Those are things that are under our control. Um, how can we measure game management? I'm not sure there's really a defined parameter of how we measure it, but, but here's some thoughts on, on what we could possibly do. Are you able to solve problems under pressure? Um, we have constant pressure. Every play um, is a decision. There's multiple decisions that you make on every play. Why you choose to throw a flag, why you choose to not, um, how you communicate with players. Um, you know, you think about if you wrote down on a list, um, as soon as a play ends, all of that dead ball period that you're spending working towards getting to that next play, you would be amazed at how you might fill up a sheet of things that you do in your preparation for the next play. 
That's some of the hardest part of the game is the game management between plays. Are you able to solve problems? You have a coach in your ear. You have a coach in your ear all the way up to the huddle being um, uh, broken. You have a coach in your ear all the way up to the time the play starts. And you have to work through those things. And, and, and those are areas there that you can work to solve problems. One of the worst things I think we can do is ignore coaches. Um, it doesn't mean we have to make constant eye contact because we have to work on our, our work, the game. But we can tell a coach, coach, I, I want to talk to you about this. I want to make sure that we have good communication, but I can't, I can't focus on that conversation right now and the game. Let me give 100% on this play, and then let's talk as soon as this play ends. Um, I had a coach uh, a couple of years ago. I was a rookie. I was in Baltimore, and uh, I had a special teams coach that was notorious um, for just getting all over uh, people. And he was one of these guys that he was very intense. And he he came up to me. He was really frustrated, thought there was a block in the back on the gunner. I had the call the whole way. I knew it was nothing. There was nothing to see. It just looked gross. And um, he was yelling at me the entire return, running up the side of the field with me. And the play ended. He was in my ear. And I said, Coach, give me just a minute. I want to talk to you about this. And we had a commercial break that came up. And he had left and went and talked. I went and found him on the back of the bench talking to somebody. And I came up to him and I said, Coach, I've been looking for you. I have a conversation piece that I want to talk with you about. And I, 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 I never had another problem. Every time we have a game with him, he always comes up to me to shake my hand and say hi. And, and he remembered that I wasn't afraid to have a conversation with him. And I went and found him. I didn't avoid the conversation. I did exactly what I said I was going to do, and that was have a conversation with him. And, and through that, um, he, he told me, he said, I appreciate, even though he, and he knew I was a rookie, and he said, I appreciate that you're not afraid to have a conversation with me. And so if we go through this in the games. Don't be afraid to talk to coaches. You know, confidence, control, strength, and courage are the four items I want to point out here. Um, it's similar to this cat walking across the screen in front of all these dogs. Uh, this is kind of us. Um, you know, we, we don't have an attitude of arrogance, um, but we can work any situation that comes about. We're not afraid uh, to do that. Uh, control. It's not an attitude of this is my field, but a respect based upon how we handle ourselves. These teams work so hard. Um, I coach high school basketball, um, and we work so hard every week to get our team prepared. And, and the, the competency of officials is important to the game. And that's what it is from that standpoint of what we do. The competency, the, the, it's not my basketball court, it's not my football field, it's not my baseball field. This is your field and your game. I'm here to, to work this under control, keep it within the parameters of the game. The strength is this, a, a presence that lets everyone know that I can handle anything thrown my way and you're not afraid to step up and make a call. Um, oftentimes, um, we, we see officials and we might know who they are, and maybe it's because of a lack of, of experience. But, man, I love having plays come my direction. Um, I, I want to have that one at my feet. I want to I be able to make the tough decision and, uh, and, and have the courage to, to do the right thing at the right time. Um, this, is, this is oftentimes what it might look like. Um, there's the one person in red that has the courage to put their hand up and answer the question. Um, those are ways that we can be. Uh, measured as strong officials. Um, as we have preparation, uh, organization, the things you're doing right now, be an expert communicator, uh, make difficult plays look easy. Um, that's that's going through and just watching film and watching games and reading your casebook. Um, that helps you make those difficult plays look easy. Show confidence and control at all times. Earn the trust of the crew, the players, the coaches, and the media. And this one here is probably as important as any. Uh, quality versus quantity on fouls. You, you can't always control um, the the false starts and the offside and and all those types of things that happen. But when it comes to judgment fouls, let, let's make sure that we have quality fouls, not just quantity. UNRs and UNSs, for example, there's a quick, spontaneous excitement. And I'll, I'll be at high school games on Friday night where my kids go to school, and and uh, there will be the the jump up in the air and chest bump. And I've seen flags fly on that. And there's no taunting with it. It's just spontaneous excitement. Know the difference between that and taunting type actions where I toss the ball in the face or maybe drop the ball in the face of the player 
that's laying on the ground. Um, the coaches and players' behavior, you know, we want coaches to be under control, but they come and they jump up, they're excited, they're chest bumping with their players four yards out on the field. You know, that, that's not necessarily an unsportsmanlike act. Those are things of we're managing a football game and let's, let's let them enjoy uh, their moments together. Putting the game together, it's like a big puzzle. Um, and, and this one here is probably one that we, we could all relate to. The postseason assignment or this game right now, is it now or is it later? You know, we're working toward a postseason assignment, but those don't happen without taking care of the things that happen now. The shared responsibility, um, oftentimes we might have seen ourselves in a boat that looks just like this, and everything is happening on our sideline, and everything is happening in our area of responsibility. And we might have officials on our crews that say, sure glad the hole isn't on our end. I'm glad that everything's staying over there. Have a cone of vision and open your vision to see things bigger. As you get better at officiating, you're going to be able to see more. Um, talking with people like Gerald Austin, um, and, and, and great referees, Gene Steratour, they all talk about see the field, see what's happening, know what's happening. And as you get better in officiating, you can start to expand your vision a little bit. But the shared responsibility, the hole on the end of this boat, can those two guys sitting up there at the top of the boat come help these two with plugging that boat up? What can you do? Uh, the crew leadership, uh, you know, identify those on your crew that have great leadership qualities and, and learn from them. What's your crew identity? What does that look like? And then the, the crew is a team. And, and this is what I want my crew every year to look like. There's not one person that's better than another. There may be more experience, but there's no one that's better. Um, it's about working together. Um, I wanna load some film up um, and, and show a couple of things uh, about uh, teamwork and, and leading into uh, my next segment. Um, is there a way that I can do that without cutting everybody off? Do I just go to the share button? Is that what I need to do next? So if you just minimize this uh, PowerPoint and pull up your video, it'll just continue to share. Okay. All right. Sharing your screen. So whatever you're seeing on your screen, we're seeing on this end. Okay. All right. Hopefully that works. All right. Don't, Let me open those up. Don't hit any X's. Just minimize. Got gotcha. you. This is a test, Brad. We're just testing <laughs> your technological skills. I agree, they're running yeah, back. Yeah, right. Can you see a video play up there? No. Okay, I've got that minimized. I'm gonna pull this back up and I'm gonna try to share that video. We still see the teamwork slide. There you go. Um, All right. The running back. Portals. Portals. Is there a what? Can you guys hear me okay? Chased out by Bowser. Portals. Portals. Can you hear me? Yes. So, okay. How do you get this? I have so. done that. Ooh. That doesn't look to be a good spot. I thought, he, I, thought he, I thought he pulled off the Russell. You know how Russell. You know how Russell, Russell. Is there a way to control that to stop it? So, uh, on your volume for the video, just when he extended, he extended that ball past the marker, and they just moved it. Back. And it hmm. seems to cut off when he it, and it's a first down for Blake Bortles. I don't have any way to be able to stop the volume. Edgeon arm, that edgeon right arm, he's carrying the ball in the, hmm. wrong, arm, in the wrong arm. Yeah, I think you just have to let it play and then hit pause and. It's out here, but he's out in the open. Well, I'm back to seeing all of the names again. I don't know what's. Receiver Allen Hurts as well. There are, yeah, the only other option then is just to let it play through your uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> on the field. So there may be three. 
fouls because there were two separate fouls on the receiver. Yeah, that I both teams. <laughs> the receiving team holding. How about Number 46. Number 81. Block it. In the back. Number 81. Personal call. Number 2 of the receiving team. Block it. While out of bounds. Holding. Number 18. Brad, can you just hit uh, mute on the sound there, on the bottom? We can't hear you, Brad, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Okay, we got you now. Okay. On you know, my screen, it just went into that circular uh, deal on it where I couldn't control anything. Um, I, I'm trying to load this PowerPoint back up again and, and try to run it through that. I don't know if that will give us what we're looking for since the video is so choppy. I um, wanted to go over some plays that demonstrate um, crew, uh, demonstrate um working through plays when we have fouls and that was one of the areas i talked with todd uh, a little bit about it's been something that um has been on my mind for the last uh, couple of years in discussions and talking points but we have plays where um we have a a foul that we throw on and there's that time and that element of where we're processing the foul we see um we see for example a block in the back and we throw on that, or we see a hold and we throw on that, and the play continues. And what happens is, is that as officials, we go into a hey, how are you? probably two to three second segment of where we're really not involved in the play anymore. We're, we are processing, there's the number, that's who held, that's the spot. And, and we've all been there, we all do it. And how can we work as a crew to better minimize missed calls on the continuation of the play. And I have some examples on there of, of some plays where there were continuation of fouls or another foul that happened on the play or more action that happened on the play. And we're missing these things. And, um, and I was hoping to be able to show some of those, but I have that on that link. Um, my PowerPoint isn't loading back up. It's just stuck, it looks like. So I don't know if that's gonna be a possibility, but, um, I want to talk a little bit about that, but um, while we're while we're trying to load that, Todd, do you have anybody that has any questions or comments or thoughts, and uh, and we can talk um, in regard to those. This is Ken. I'll jump in. Um, I love the communication with the introducing yourself to the coaches prior to the game. I I find that when I seek them out and uh, shake assistant coaches' hands and head coaches' hands and just let my presence be known it, it just seems like it opens up the communication even before the game starts yeah i agree with that it's such a good practice to have um that that does it mitigates problems and it develops there's a human level that comes with this um people see you and they now have a a relationship to to this and uh, and they can they can then come to you with something later on in the game. Um, I had a coach one time come to me before the game. I've never had him before, but I knew that he was quite a screamer and a yeller. Anybody ever work for somebody like that? Um, and uh, he came to me before the game and he said, uh, can you handle being yelled at? And I said, well, I guess that depends upon what your meaning of getting yelled at is. And he said, I, I, I talk a lot. Now I'll get after you. And I said, Coach, if it's legitimate to get after me, I said, that's fine. I said, my parents got on me all the time when I was a kid. So I'm I'm okay. And so we had a play where I was down there about the seven yard line 
and he came running all the way down, and it was a critical part of the game. He came running all the way down to about the 15, screaming and hollering. Now, he's out of the coach's box, and what am I allowed to do at that point uh, with him being out of the coach's box? I mean, we could we could go to levels of unsportsmanlike, but I, I understood the juncture of the game, and I understood what was happening here, that if I throw a flag right now for an unsportsmanlike, an automatic first down for the other team, and it puts them at first and goal. And I looked down, and I kind of looked at his feet, and I looked back up at him. I said, what are you doing down here? And he said, you guys, you missed this. And I said, please get back in the box. I don't want to have to get involved in the game this way. And and he kind of looked down where he was. He just lost where he was. He, he wasn't meaning to come out of the box to be a complete jerk. He was trying to literally have a conversation, and he just lost where he was. And and he kind of kind of backed up for a moment and he got back inside the box and then he started having the conversation. And I said, Coach, after this play, I'm gonna run down there and I'm gonna have a conversation with you. And and I got down there and the conversation was completely mitigated because I didn't get involved in the game. Could I have thrown a flag on it? Absolutely could have. But it 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 would have been more of a problem than trying to solve through the situation. Every situation has its own talking points. And so I'm not saying that's the, the canned answer to every situation, but, but understand time and circumstances of the game. Understand that when your flag goes on the ground, what, what can happen with that? Um, the, 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 the processes of discussion about officials after a game, nobody wants to be the topic of conversation. So think about how you can mitigate a problem without using your flag. Can you guys see this here? Yes. yes, sir. Okay. This is this is the segment here, and if it, if it works, that's great. Um, I, is there before I hit play or what have you on this on this next play that's coming up? Is there a way to pause and and start and all that on this particular um, device? I I can't answer that question, Dennis or Dana. Can one of you guys jump in? Uh, what was the question? I had to step out just for a second. Is there a way to be able to pause plays on this? Pop, I'm sorry. Say it again, sir. Is there a way to be able to pause and, and hit play and pause when I start this play up here in just a moment? Yeah, you should be able to control that on, on your end if you probably just put your cursor over the over the play and, and double tap it should stop it. Okay. All right. We'll try to do that. Well, here, here's some thoughts. This is dealing with officiating before and after the flag. And, and uh, I've got some things in here that I want to share with you, bullet points, and then hopefully we can see some plays. Um, know your keys and identify player numbers. Um, I had a veteran guy tell me one time years ago when we were out working a scrimmage, he said, be able to know your keys before the play starts. Whenever, if you're working field judge, side judge, back judge, whatever, know who your keys are identify them out and you know some people might think that you sound a little funny back there talking to yourself but i would i would literally say my defensive back is number 24 my offensive player is number 88 and and i always knew that and at the end of the play if i couldn't tell you what happened after the play then i felt like i missed something be able to know the story of what happened and I'm not, I'm not trying to say be married to your keys and only know what happens with them, but identify players that you start with. Know who you start with. And then as you transition from zone to zone on the way that plays may take you, be able to identify and know what happens with players. Um, hopefully this will help us, especially if there's a pass play. 24 was on number 88. I've got a pass play. I've got a foul. I've, I have said out loud to myself, 24 is my defensive player. 88 is my offensive player. I've said that out loud to myself. And at the end of the play, if I have a foul, I can always, it, it's funny how your brain remembers what you say out loud. Um, pass interference number 24. Um, offensive pass interference number 88. Um, those types of things. So it helps you be able to do that. And, and then you can process the play clearer. Um, identifying a foul. You know, hand fighting, those kind of things. Let's make our fouls be quality fouls. Processing a player's number. Um, you may have to process a player's number on a player that you didn't start with. 
So be able to process that. Don't be in too big of a hurry when the play ends. Just take an eye and, and make sure, yes, that is number 33 uh, that was the defensive player on that. Um, and then our integrity and our flag. Uh, everything uh, is associated with that flag. It's our integrity. And so make sure that whenever you do throw, it's a good quality foul. Um, this is a play here I want to share with you. Um, and hopefully uh, I can get it to play and pause. I'm going to start it up. I don't know if it will allow me to do that. Let's see here. It doesn't appear to give me a way to be able to play it. Hmm. Any other tricks that we can think of? Try your space bar. See if your space bar will activate it. That, that shot me down a play. Let's see. Hmm. Space bar takes it down. And there's also on, on mine, there's F keys. Like F5 is the play and pause. Okay, let's see if we can get that to work. No, it's not letting me do it. Well, on this play here, um, I'll just try to walk you through it, and then you can you can view it for yourself. On this play, um, the, the runner comes around the end over here, and a player peels back and blocks a player below the waist, and the play continues to stretch out to the side. Um, when you watch this, uh, try to take a look at it from the standpoint of I see the play, I, I identify the play, um, and then I have to continue to officiate the play. If you're working a five-man crew, you're going to see on the outside, the outside receiver is coming back into the middle, and that will take the back judge's attention away. Um, he'll be watching that guy coming in and seeing if it's, a, if it's some sort of a, a hit that's illegal, and the play will continue to stretch around this way. So if you're on the line of scrimmage and you make this call, um, You've got to see more. You've got to be able to see more. Um, on this next play, uh, when you watch it, the center, uh, it's obviously setting up to be a screen pass, and the center comes all the way down and then blocks low back in toward the original position of the ball. And um, regardless if you want to get into 10-2, uh, college stuff, uh, you know, I'm not sure who all um, is on this that, that works different levels. Um, but just taking a look at it from the standpoint of, now, all of a sudden, this guy's down here in this wheelhouse. Quarterback rolls out and throws the ball away. And uh, I believe in Federation, is that still intentional grounding if you throw the ball away? I believe it is intentional grounding. Yeah, okay. it's, it's grounding in Fed. Okay. So, yeah, so yeah. just take a look at the play itself. Um, hey, Jason, how are you doing? It's good to see you on there. Um, but when you watch when you watch the quarterback roll out, just just take a look at the entirety of the play, how it breaks down. Um, on this next one here, you're going to see a play where quarterback um, he comes down the field and he's the lead blocker on the play. And as he's the lead blocker on this play, um, he gets blocked below the waist by a defensive player, and then the runner continues and runs down a couple more yards. As you're a deep wing on this or a short wing, and you see this. You've got multiple things to be able to work through and officiate and continue um, on the play. Uh, the challenges on this play, and this is, I'm going to fully disclose and admit, this is a massive miss on my part. Um, don't ever be afraid to show your misses because it shows, number one, that you're not uh, immune to uh, making a mistake. Um, but it, it, it's also, it's, it's humbling. It, it allows you to hit a reset of, uh, of what, you're, uh, what you're doing on the field. Whenever you see this play, this, this left tackle is going to come out and block. And he's legally blocking. And then he grabs hold of and, and holds. And I'm down here on the bottom end. I'm, I'm on the deep sideline. And I throw the flag for holding. And as I throw the flag, the play continues. And the receiver comes around the end and runs down the field right in front of me. He gets his face mask pulled. And, and prior to this face mask pulling, I throw my flag. I'm trying to throw it to a quiet area so that I don't hit people. Um, I'm processing it was number 77. And what I, what I learned on this was when I'm working deep, I'll just process these guys here because these in the mechanics book say these are mine. 
take a look all the way in. Take a look all the way in and see who the tackle is. Always know the tackle that's on your side because a lot of times they're going to be the ones that are blocking in an area that you might be officiating in. And, and number 77 was the guy. I threw the flag. It was, it was the right place, right spot, all of that good stuff. And on the play as it developed, I transitioned too late back to what I needed to see at the end of the play, and I missed a face mask. You're going to look at it and go, how in the world do you miss that? The next segment of the play, there's a possible block in the back, but the guy comes into the side, the defender starts to turn during the block, and he goes into the runner, and I'm trying to determine, do I have a block in the back now? And I completely and totally miss the face mask. I looked up on the board after the play just to see how wonderful my hold was and how good I judged on not throwing block in the back, and my stomach turned upside down when I saw the face mask pull as well. So it's, it's, it's important that we learn to expand our vision, but it's also important that we slow down. The hold is going to be there. And, and my other challenge is this, as a back judge back here, as a line of scrimmage guy down here, how can we help? When we see a flag fly, the assumption is, is that, oh, the flag is probably for what I'm seeing there. If you see a foul, and it's a safety foul especially, don't be afraid to come in and throw on it. You know, some people are like, oh, those are me too flags or whatever. Those are, in my opinion, those are, I'm not going to make an assumption that that's what you saw. If you don't throw your flag, come in and at least have a conversation. Come in and communicate with me and say, hey, wait a minute. Did you also see the face mask on that? No, I didn't. I, I completely missed that. This is another play that happened to us last year. It's week 17. We were blessed to go to Buffalo. I'm sure all of you would love to do something like that. Um, this play here, it stretches around to the end. And this, this guy right here comes back in. And I don't want to get into the debates of, is it a block in the back? Is it not? Um, it, it, that was what was called. But as this play happens and the block in the back happens, the runner around the end here gets his face mask pulled about right up in this area. And our deep wing is in the process of throwing his flag as all of this is happening. And the assumption was after the play, he must have gotten the face mask. And then it comes to where they're reporting that we, we, we kind of lost what all was going on with the play. So I want to share that one with you as well. How can we help as back judges? Our umpire has this unique vision here. Is there a way he could see that? Is there a way he could see? I don't know if he could see clearly if the face mask was pulled or if it was a hand up the side of the head or, or what it could have been. But it's another good play to try to learn from and talk about. How do we see this uh, instead of assuming that that flag is the foul? Uh, this is a great example of seeing two things basically at one time. Um, I'm very envious of this referee here. He, he was my referee in my second season, um, but it's, man, it's, it's fantastic officiating. You're going to see in this area here on the field a hold, and he throws his flag, and then you're going to see a peel back where a guy comes back, and, and it, it may not be a foul in, in, in your uh, football rules, so just do with it what you need. But the fact is he was able to transition and see this peel back and hit helmet to helmet. And, and going back toward the, uh, the end line. And it was two pieces of things that happened, and he processed it well. Probably the best part of it is, is that he gave himself distance to be able to see it. But I, 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 I still brag on him about this play, about how good he did on, on getting both fouls on this play. Uh, this is a play that uh, I was a participant in, and it's a play with, involved with tripping. And... Um, after the play, um, when I had the foul of tripping, the defender is getting blocked. He sticks his leg out and he trips the guy. And after the play, my uh, co-official downfield from me, my line of scrimmage guy, he comes up to me and he went, he went, did you, what, what do you have? I mean, he was kind of surprised because it was a big hit at the end of it. And I said, I have tripping. And he looked at me with a puzzled look. He said, dripping? He said, I was coming to make sure you didn't have uh, like a targeting type foul, a helmet to helmet type situation. I said, oh, no. I said, the guy stuck his leg out and tripped him, and he was like, well, okay. But, but the point being is, is he came in question. He didn't just assume that, well, my flag was down, so I'm always right when I throw a flag. He came in question, what do you have? Because I saw something a little differently. I had something completely different. So don't be afraid to come and ask a question if you're like, hey, wait a minute. What are you calling? What do you have on this? Oh, okay. Well, I, I thought maybe you had something else. This is a, a play here. 
that involves, it, take a look at the time, nine seconds left. It's 20 to 20. If you could read my lips, um, they're reciting what I'm going to say for overtime. Um, I, I, I seriously am mouthing as I back up how I'm going to communicate the overtime when I go out to flip the coin. Um, this was one of those games that looked like it was heading straight toward it. And uh, some of you living in New Mexico might get Denver games. You might remember this game. There was a pass interference called um, on this play down the field. And the point being with this is the flag is thrown. There was a cutoff on the route. The defender cuts the guy's route off toward the sideline. And the flag lands about four yards downfield of where the foul happens. And our crossfield official comes in and says, hey, I saw your contact, and it happened at the 35, not the 31. And the, the, the greatness about having replay upstairs is I can ask, hey, what yard line do we need to put this thing down on? Because we kicked a field goal here, and I've got the next play uh, connected to this where you'll see the field goal lined up at the 35 or 36. But, but the point being with it, when you're working deep and you're running backwards and you throw your flag, most of the time, you miss the spot by five yards. You miss it by five to six yards, and, and it's a good play to remind yourself about adjusting flags. And when your co-official across the field from you throws a flag, be willing to go in and help. Hey, the spot is here. You see it so much differently from across the field than you do seeing it coming at you. So it's a good play to learn from. It's a good one to talk about. In, in terms of helping get spots correct when spots matter on a foul. Um, this next play, or next segment of plays, these are the last two uh, that you'll see. It's a kickoff. And uh, this player here, I circle it. As the play starts, you'll see him circled. He'll come down, and he holds, um, and, and holds, and the hold continues up about three or four yards, and then the guy is tackled five yards beyond that. And our flag is thrown from way up here down the field. And with this, um, we missed the foul by seven yards as far as where it happened. So it really turned into about, oh, a seven-yard penalty or so. It didn't turn into the 10-yard foul uh, that, we would, that we would normally have on it for the hold. So getting the spot correct, if we miss it with a couple of yards, that, that's one thing. But if we can get where how, how would a hold happen right at where he got tackled that, that made a difference in the play? We need to start computing and, and talking about those. And this is a play that I'm using on game one um, that, that we need to talk about um, in regard to getting our flag at the spot of the foul or as best as we can. Um, on this same segment, there'll be another play from this game where there was a punt, and you'll see the end zone shot. And the line of scrimmage official that's downfield from it You'll see where um, he throws on a blindside block. The back judge throws on a blindside block. And you'll see the line of scrimmage official. He throws on this and then immediately gets back into the play. Talking about that whole segment of time that we lose, this guy's worked four Super Bowls. He's pretty good. Um, but he, he transitions from throwing a flag to getting back on the play where the runner is returning this punt for an apparent touchdown, and he steps out of bounds just short of the goal line, and he gets it. it. It's that kind of officiating that we all need to strive to get to, where we can do multiple things sometimes at once and, and work to transition. So uh, I'll send that video to Todd, um, and you're welcome to download that, use that, throw it away, uh, do whatever you'd like with it. But these are some really good plays, I believe, that can spawn some good conversation with you, your crew, your friends, um, and, and help you be able to talk about how do we get better with throwing a flag and transitioning back to officiating the play and not missing things. So that's all I have on that. Um, I'll uh, turn it over to questions, comments, uh, any number of things. Um, so I'll turn it back to you guys. Yes, sir. There's somebody typed in a question. If I don't, uh, I'll read it for them. Um, from your earlier point about seeing the field, how do you both focus on a specific area and see the whole field at the same time? Question mark. I think that comes with practice and time. Um, I'm still working on it. I, I'm not saying that I've got the answers to that. Every play has a unique quality to itself. Um, so with that, um, that every play has its own identifiers. But from a standpoint of looking at it um, with a broad brush, 
looking at a play and taking care of your job, doing your part, that's what we want to do first. We want to take care of what we need to take care of and then help someone else. The last thing we want to do is go reel in a minnow out of somebody else's tank. Uh, if you're going to go catch a well, go catch a well, but don't reel in a minnow. And when we're officiating a play, your circle of coverage, your area of coverage, take care of that. When a pass is thrown, like in that Denver game, when a pass is thrown deep, pretty much everybody on the field starts to stop. Plays happen in less than seven seconds. When the ball is thrown deep, shift our eyes to be able to help with catch, no catch. You see his flag fly. Make a mental image right then. Here's where part of that contact starts. And I'm going to go and ask him because the spot is so critical. Um, I'm going to ask him, hey, do you think your flag is in the right spot? Um, when you throw a foul for a, something that has a spot foul, um, go pick your flag up and put it on the spot. You may say, hey, I hit the yard line perfectly. I'm a line judge or I'm a head linesman. And, and I, all I have to do is just throw it straight into the yard line where it happened. Even if you throw it on the spot, I used to always go pick it up and move it on that same yard line, just move it somewhere else, just to give the appearance of I'm not that good. I'm not that perfect. I may have hit the yard line just like I wanted, but I'll just go pick it up and move it a foot and say, hey, you know, I'm on the, I'm on the spot. The perception of that, um, that my flag isn't perfect all the time. Hope that answers your question. Did you talk about that? Good morning, sir. I have a question in reference to the umpire. What's your opinion having the umpire directly across from you in the backfield versus having him behind the defensive line? My opinion is, is that college football has it right. Um, I, I think I share that with a lot of people. And in fact, I've, I've heard people in the higher up say, hey, you know what? We really miss having the umpire over on that side of the ball. I think it helps from several different things. Um, you have someone over there on that side, not just watch for the defensive holds that are happening now. We, we've got kind of a hole in it there, and that's why we have our back judge involved more um, with looking inside the interior, kind of like an umpire would look. With that, um, there's also been the advantages. Um, the people that, that typically foul on plays are offensive players. And, um, you know, just like a referee's view, they have that view on that same side as well. Um, but there's, there's definitely a disadvantage to it. We have to expand our vision. We have to see more. Um, you know, they give more responsibilities to the line of scrimmage on players downfield on pass plays uh, illegally. Um, so there's, there's definitely advantages of having umpires on the other side of the ball taking care of problems from that layer. Uh, you, look at a, you look at a football play, and it's like an onion. You, you, you peel back different layers to it. And, and having someone on that other side of the onion, if you will, being able to peel it back and get to the core of, of what's happening um, is definitely an advantage. We've had our back judge, we've had our deep wings have to come in from 30, 40 yards away to help break something up that we just can't see on that other side. So um, as long as you can keep that umpire on that side of the ball, on the, on the side you have them on, man, keep doing it. Keep fighting for that. Um, I found that my mentor co coming up has really helped me a great deal. Who has been your biggest uh, mentor or, you know, somebody you want to point out along the way? A um, gentleman that's out of, out of Lubbock. Um, his name is Tim Hadley. Um, probably no one on here would even know who he is. Um, he was a professor in college when I started college uh, here in Lubbock. And uh, he, uh, he talked about football every Monday in class. You know, remember whenever you try to distract your coaches in, in history class or whatever class they taught, try to distract them a little bit to get out of doing work. That was our, that was that guy. Um, he talked about football every Monday and um, I, I just enjoyed listening to it. And he's like, Hey, why don't you come out and officiate? And I said, I don't, I don't think that's for me. I, I yell at officials. I don't, I don't want to be one. And so as he kept working and breaking me down, um, he, he talked me into it. And with him being here on campus, uh, he was the assignment secretary for all sub varsity games. And he told me, he said, hey, I have people call in every Thursday because they've got something that's happening and they can't work. Come by and see me. I'll give you some games. And uh, he, was a, he was a referee in the Lone Star Conference, um, which uh, to me was, that was, that was a, 
so far away, I didn't even know what the Lone Star Conference was. Um, and, and he was a quality, great official. And to this day, um, every Sunday night after my games, I get a phone call from him or I get a text message from him. Um, when I worked in the Southeastern Conference, I'd get a text message or a phone call from him after the game. Uh, that's, that's someone that valued me and mentored me. And, and I see him as a guy that I can still learn from. He's retired. He's been off the field now for about 15 years. Um, continued to umpire um, baseball, college baseball, Division One baseball, but um, he understands the game. And and I'll say this from the standpoint of people when they when they quit working, whenever they retire because they physically can't do it anymore. Um, if you're going to mentor and help people, be sharper than you've ever been. Um, your mind is the part that that still understands the game. Your body says no. There's a man that's out of Denver named Tom Finken. And uh, he's probably one of the most decorated field judges of all time in the National Football League. And he's been off the field now 11 years. And I heard him say at my first clinic that I went to in 2017 as an on-field official, he said, guys, I've been off the field now for, I think it was seven, he said at the time. Um, he said, I, I am a better official today than I was when I left the field. And if you're going to continue to stick around and help mentor people, be better than you were when you left the field. Um, I think that's probably the things that I'll take away from this someday whenever uh, physically I'm not able to do it anymore and I want to continue to help. And that's how I feel about my mentor today that's here in Lubbock. Um, he, uh, he still means a lot to me and um, still understands when I miss something. How do you balance your, uh, your time with uh... – Football officiating, your your personal job, and your family. Outlook calendar. Um, <laughs> that's probably that's probably more true than not. Um, you know, I try to make sure that Mondays are all about family. Um, I just don't do anything football wise on Monday. I make sure that I get my pre games all completed um, prior um, to Monday. So when I'm on an airplane flying home on Sunday night, um, I have an outline of things that I want to make sure that I cover. I build, I build pregame outlines um, out more than just a week at a time. I build out things two and three and four weeks at a time that I want to cover. Um, and so I have pretty much everything ready, uh, maybe with just a couple of talking points I want to change. And I send my pregame out um, Sunday night for the next game with all the information on it of travel, all of that. So that's over with. So I don't have to worry about it on Monday. Uh, Monday is very important uh, that we go out to eat as a family on Monday night. We, we make sure that we do that. Um, I, I'm in class at eight o'clock on Monday morning. So I've had, I've had flights get canceled out of Dallas. I'm on usually that 11 o'clock flight at night out of Dallas. And I've rented cars multiple times, had to do it two or three times uh, last year where I had to uh, drive home and uh, pull into town at six o'clock in the morning, go turn the car in, take a shower and head straight to class. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a balance. You have to be able to learn to do it. Um, and balancing my work, I don't ever want this to get in the way of my job here. Um, and so sometimes you just have to kind of do a little more to be able to, to make it work. But family, I'm telling you right now, it's probably the most important thing that I do uh, outside of work and outside of football, even though you spend hours and hours of preparation, you've got to make sure you take care of family. Hey guys, we, we promised to keep them close to an hour. How about one or two more questions and we'll wrap up. Well, Brad, uh, great to see you on here. I remember uh, working with you back, uh, you know, when I was in uh, Lubbock. Um, I got a little memory from that arena Two league, uh, Back when I was working chains behind you in 2007, you know, when I came up and you said, man, I hate down by contact. <laughs> <laughs> then I see you working in the NFL, you know, 10 years later. So I'd say since 2007, it's gotten a little easier. Um, you know, just don't work with a whistle anywhere close to your mouth and uh, I think you'll be OK. But yeah, that was some good times. That I remember in 2007 uh, working my first arena game. I'd seen arena games on TV, um, but uh, when we got on the field that day, uh, the guys that were on that crew, now were all guys that I'd worked Division Two with, 
and uh, Mark Wyndham was the referee out of Odessa. Greg Adams was the umpire. Uh, Glenn Fusick was out of Houston, um, and uh, and there was Chad Lawrence was on the line of scrimmage across from me, and he's in the Southeastern Conference now. Anyway, we we're out there working this game. At the end of the first quarter, I remember we all met together in the middle of the field, and everybody out there was going, "Does anybody have a clue what's going on?" Um, and it was it was a de- definitely a different kind of game. If you've ever worked arena football of any kind, it, it doesn't have to be the arena football league or arena two. If you've ever worked a football game indoors uh, on a small field, it's like trying to officiate your kids in the living room. Um, it is it is quite a treat. It's, it's a lot of fun. So definitely made the game better. If you do have an opportunity to get to officiate and something like that, go do it. It makes you so much better. Uh, the game slows down outdoors immensely. I miss working arena football. Uh, for the fact that it slows the outdoor game down. Well, it's good to see you, Jason. Yeah, good seeing you too, Brad. Hey, now, you hey, hear anything? I'm good. I just want to thank Todd uh, for bringing in our guest today. And I know I'll speak for everybody. It's fantastic, even without the video. I'm sorry. Yeah, Ken, you're a little muffled. Um, Dana, do you have anything? Really, Brad, I just want to say thank you. That was fantastic. I took a bunch of notes, and I'm looking forward to watching it, watching the presentation again, even though I just saw it, because that is a, that is solid gold you just served us. So I really do appreciate it. And, uh, again, thank you for spending your time with us this morning. And uh, we, we look forward to hearing from you again, and we're hopeful that you have a season this year so that we can hear you on on a – on your games this season. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. it it's, uh, you know, I, I'll say this in, in closing. If, if it's easy to say getting to, to, to work in the National Football League, um, but be present with where you are. Um, I see oftentimes with officials, and I was guilty of this, um, aspiring to do something different. You know, you're always wanting more. And, and I can tell that people that are spending Saturday getting on this and doing this and, and, and getting on it last night, you're taking time away from uh, friends and family. Um, but what can happen at times, too, is as you start to get that, I'm putting all this work into it, I'm putting all this time into it, why aren't things happening better? Why aren't things moving quicker? Um, I didn't get to go to a clinic and just get hired. Um, I I mean, it was years of, of going through uh, different steps and levels. And, and that may be your path. Um, and then your path may be you know, people see you work and they're like, man, we've got to get this, this individual on the field. Uh, you never know what your path will be. Embrace and enjoy your path, but always enjoy the moment you're in. Don't look for what will happen in two years or five years. Um, that, that will drive you nuts. It'll take you off your game. You won't be as focused. And when the time does come, uh, for someone to look at you, um, you may not be at the at the peak of your game like you should be. A very good friend of mine um, was working a sub varsity game, and um, he just kind of blew it off. He he did not take the game seriously, and in the stands was a scout for the Pac-10 conference that was there to watch him work, and they wanted to see how he would handle himself in a sub varsity game. And he came down to him at halftime of that game. And he said, you know, I came here to watch you work. There's been a lot of hype, and I'm, I'm not impressed. You act like you don't even care about being out here. Every game matters. It doesn't matter if it's a flag game. It doesn't matter if it's the, the two worst teams in, their, in the district playing or whatever. You've got to make sure that you work every game like it's the most important one. You never know um, who's watching you and who's, who's taking a look to see if you're ready for that next step. So uh, I encourage you definitely live in the presence, uh, present of, of what's happening. Great stuff, Brad. And um, I'm gonna hold you to your promise and waiting for that coin flip flip where you're using the Albuquerque football coin that- uh, Hang on a second. Hang on just a second, Brad. I've got that coin, I've got it right here. I don't know if that's coming through very well, but I've got the coin and uh, I have it sitting there. It's going to be used in a game this year. 
um, that's been that's been a lot of fun uh, to do. Uh, there were some guys that that, um, <clears throat> that went that to the Stars cool. and Stripes. If you've done that particular academy, uh, the Stars and Stripes Academy, uh, they sent me one of their coins, and I used it to flip in a game last year. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll use this coin. I'll flip it in a game, and then uh, I'll get it back to you. How about that? That is so cool. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, the, co the coin is yours to keep, but the video would be cool to have. Okay. I'll see if we can get something like that. They don't, they don't record them a lot of times, but, um, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really awesome to get to do that. Some of my uh, good friends here in Lubbock that I've officiated with uh, in high school and, and so forth, um, they've sent their game coin with me, and I've flipped it at games. And uh, so it's a lot of fun to be able to flip their coins, take a little piece of them, you know, always remember who who the people are that have been around you that have helped you and, and shape you and mold you as an official. So, but no, I haven't forgotten. I, I've got your coin right here. Um, I plan on taking it. And so the pride of New Mexico will be flipped up somewhere. Um, might have you name it where you want it to be flipped. So, um, but uh, okay. we'll that is uh, that is too cool, Isn't it? and uh, now I feel jealous, and I'll have to send you an NMOA one too, because now I now I want a piece of the action. That was that is so cool. I have goosebumps right now. I'm pumped. No, you're too. Right. No, he he charges after mine. So, <laughs> you're, you're, okay. <laughs> so, uh, hey, uh, Brad, we appreciate it. Um, you know, if you feel like you have some more stuff to tell us. If this uh, coronavirus keeps us in the house, feel free to reach out and give us another presentation when when you're ready. We're more than welcome. Yeah, to we can do a lot of different things. There's there this this game just continues to grow and hopefully we keep getting better. So enjoy we being here. Appreciate your time. Today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Absolutely. I hope it hope it meets some needs and hopefully we uh we we can take something from it. Brad, thanks, brother. I'm sure I'll be talking to you here shortly. Please, lose my number, Todd. Yeah, we, what? We really Todd, lose my number, will you? Yeah, I'll just lose that number real quick. I just deleted it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did text Todd uh, the uh, presentation, so uh, yeah. if I'll yeah. send that. I don't know if texting or emailing is the best way to go about, but uh, shoot it out well, to him. Email it to Yeah, email it to me, brother. Okay, I the text that I don't know if I can. I'm not smart enough, probably. So. But thank you so very much, Brad, for your time, man. And uh, we'll see you down the road, I'm sure. I'll owe you some Torchy's tacos. Is that Ken on there, too? I see Ken up there. Hey, thanks, everybody, for joining in. I appreciate everybody tuning in all the time and, and continuing the football education. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care.